Hey, welcome everybody. It's Don Slavik with the United States Police Canine Association. Today we're going to talk about behavior changes. And I think it needs to be said that more people need to understand what a behavior change is, where how it how it manifests itself, what does it mean, and things that you should be looking at when you are uh, when you think you have a behavior change. Today I have with me Steve White, retired sergeant from the, canine, the Seattle Police Canine Unit. And we're going to just discuss it back and forth for you so you get some good ideas on what you think you should you should know about that. Hi, Steve. Hey, Don. Thanks for having me today. I, I'm looking forward to this conversation. Well, I think it's it's important that everybody understands the importance of it, not just that uh, my dog had a behavior change and that was it. It's, it means something. And it, it, there's things that follow from a behavior change. And, and I think that... Uh, it's just it's it's something that needs to be said. It needs to be we need to get it out there. We can't just keep hiding it somewhere, not talking about it. But what is a behavior change, and so on. Well, you know, I I think that um, it's really easy while you're going through in a canine academy and you're dealing with the nuts and bolts of training a dog to do things to kind of um, just assume that people are going to figure out how to read their dogs, and that isn't the problem. I've made that mistake. It just seems so patently obvious to me that the dog's behavior was changing, but you've been a trainer long enough for me. I mean, look, let's think about this as trainers. You're running a track with a new handler, right? And you see the dog do something that tells you that it's either lost the track or it's back on the track or whatever. You see something significant, a change in that dog's behavior. And you say there, see that? What are the next two words you're more likely to, most likely to hear? what well see what <laughs> see what I, I don't know what you're talking yeah. about and the trouble well, is yeah. because because they don't know what they're looking for in that moment this novice handler new handlers mm -hmm. because they don't know what they're looking for they don't know what to do it so we we've addressed that in a separate video that we'll talk about and we'll link to associate with this and with the thousand hour eyes presentation which talks about a, a systematic way of learning to read a dog and you can fix that problem of people not knowing how to do it but we got to, this is more about why, why, why is this so daggone important to us as canine handlers and trainers and supervisors? And the bottom line is this, I don't care how cool your, your Malinois is, your Dutchie, your shepherd, your whatever, what kind of man work it does. That stuff is secondary to scent work. That's canine's reason for being. There's nothing in the inventory of any law enforcement agency that can replace what a dog can do with its nose. We got a lot of tools that can go ahead and fill in the gap about applying force, but nothing can replace what the dog can do with its nose. So this is where we need to have true expertise. This is where we literally, and you know, we actually need to qualify as experts in certain realms to talk about what our dogs do. And we sell that, um, short a lot of times in our training so for me you know this is what we need to because if you understand how to how to read a dog and you understand the systematic way of doing it then you can communicate better to judges juries prosecutors your own bosses you know the community leaders but most importantly to the patrol officers you're working with you know, you, you want to be able to use that dog to maybe help them make more informed decisions, better informed decisions during an operation, a search operation. And so that's why you have to become an expert in reading your dog. And I'm, and I emphasize that your dog part about it. So are we on the same page on that? Is that kind of why you wanted to have this conversation? I totally agree because, uh, you know, people need to, I always tell people the first thing I look at when I'm looking at a dog team working is I watch the dog. The dog tells me everything that, how his training has been, how everything is going on. You can tell when he's not, when he's not searching anymore, when he's searching, you can see the excitement in the, in his body movement or his tail wagging when he gets, when he comes in contact with the owner, when he has a behavior change, it's, it's something that you have to watch. And it's, it's, it's kind of, 
interesting for young handlers to figure it out that they not only have to make sure that the dog is searching everything that should be searched, but they also have to be watching the dog to see what the behavior changes are, because that is the most important thing. If you miss it and you keep walking, the dog walks with you, then there's a problem. And and again, referring back to that other video, the thousand hour eyes, that's why that's so powerful. Because if you harness the power of video, you can cut in time, uh, the, the time it takes to teach somebody to read their dog, at least in half, if not down to a third of what it would normally take. So we can get into that because you you talked about something. As a canine handler, you you're dealing with something that nobody else in the search team is going to deal with. And that is you've got um, a tool that can give you information that is beyond our capabilities. And it's the only tool we've got that can provide that particular capability. We have floor that maybe can heat see, see heat sources and things like that. But a well-trained dog can tell you the difference between a human being and a deer that would create the heat source and floor would have to figure out which is, you know, you'd have to figure out which is which. So let, let's kind of take a look at this and think first in the different realms, because I'm going to, I think I'd like to talk about detector dogs and why this is important for them. Then human search dogs have two flavors, the patrol dogs and the ser search and rescue dogs. And then finally the tracking dogs, um, particularly patrol tracking where it's criminal apprehension but it'll still apply to trailing dogs that are doing search and rescue operations and things like that, or other law enforcement operations. It's still going to be the same. So um, if you've got a detector dog and you, you have probably taught it some kind of trained final response that says this, juries like trained final responses. Judges like trained final responses. Prosecutors like trained final responses because it gives them clarity in making a decision about what the dog did or didn't do, right? If you've got to interpret what the dog did, that puts a filter between what they can see with their eyes and what's going on. You have to tell them, yeah, this is actually how my dog tells me this. Whereas if it's a sit or a down, then that's pretty clear. And you, it reduces the amount of communication you have to do. Then the only question is, is was the odor that, you know, was it the target odor that, that, that triggered that? Um, but there's a whole movement now, particularly that's bleeding over from the sport realm with the canine nose work and, and AKC scent work that um, where people are training their dogs not to have a trained final response or at least a big gross motor motor movement one like a sit or a down they're just teaching a freeze just freeze and that's it why because those are timed events and you know the amount of time it takes to acquire the sit and then get out of it and get back to the search again adds time and can be the difference between you know being at the top of the podium and getting a blue ribbon and going home with nothing in your hands and so um, there's value in that you they develop excellent dog reading skills and they develop really good training skills in training that, but train final responses that are unnatural behavior, something the dog would not acquire otherwise make it easy for judges and juries. That's why they're there. So the question is, is what's the downside to these trained final responses? Well, the downside is, is sometimes they fail. There's a number of reasons you got, sometimes the environment won't let a dog acquire a sit. It's, you know, it's in a bat, batch of cactus or you're in a junkyard and there's a whole bunch of broken auto parts there. Uh, fill in the blanks. You can see it. There are places where you can do it. Sometimes the placement of the odor is in a position where the dog's urge to get to it supersedes their desire to sit. And that's a training issue. You can fix that. But the other things you got to look at are physiology. You know, is your dog, um, is, is there something in your dog's physical state that's interfering with its ability to do the sit? Is it, you know, too, is it old and all the stiff bones that come from, I can barely get up out of my easy chair now. <laughs> so you know, asking a dog to get in, get down there and get back up is a lot for an old dog. And I've got an old dog at home and she's like, oh, you mean there are three stairs to get back in the house? No, I don't want to do that. If I were trying to train her to do a final response right now, I wouldn't make her go through the effort of training to sit. And sometimes it's an injury. And sometimes when a dog is sick, if they have 
gastric distress, if their stomach is really hurting them, they're going to go, yeah, that, I don't want to, I don't want to put my upper body pressure on top of that. And so you'll see some dogs when they're feeling poorly, won't want to sit. And then other things, there's just the innate structure. And I've, I, I can remember when I went through dog school back in the seventies, they were experimenting with what they called Scotia dogs that could actually run through the duct work on cargo planes. And they were looking at dachshunds. Well, you got to get down on your hands and knees to see if that dachshund is sitting sometimes. And so it, it's not that it doesn't work. It's that it's not always as apparent as you might think. So there are pros and cons to a trained final response. You got to do this. But the one thing that if you do your job right, you will always be able to do, whether there's a trained final response that actually occurs or you're doing it just based on a trained behavior, is interpret that animal's behavior to make a decision about what's there and what needs follow up on. And telling people who are watching your body camera about what's going on. So this is why learning to read your dog is really important is because trained final responses are a really good thing, but there are all sorts of things that can get in the way. Um, you got anything you want to throw in on that, Don? No, I was just thinking as you're talking about that is that in actuality, when they get the behavior change, that's, that's telling you that they've just came across a train, one of their trained odors, and now they are following that supposedly to where the, the, uh, the stuff is hidden, say. And uh, and then you come into the, the sits or the downs or whatever, and it is. It's hard. It's hard. You train your dog to sit, then the court says something about, you know, well, how about he didn't sit underneath the car? Well, he can't sit under the car. So I understand. And I also realize, too, that more people are coming in with focus, you know, the focus sit. You know, they're mm -hmm. just sitting there staring at it. But, yeah, the train file behind his response is, is a big deal because it's the first indication that your dog has hit a, something that they're trained on. And, and I'm, yeah. I'll, I'll tell you, Don, you know, the, the dogs that give you a, a stare at the location, that focused response, and the dogs that sit and like pivot at you and like, hey, you, hairless primate. You with the opposable thumbs, pay me. I just found this for you. They're both sufficiently clear to a jury or to a judge that they'll say, yeah, that's the trained final mm -hmm. response. They're cool. They're both cool. Um, one takes more work to maintain. And so uh, it can give you some real benefits. But in the end, we this is about learning to read that dog's behavior. You should know before that dog acquires that behavior whether they're right or wrong. That's, and I'm going to tell you this as someone who certifies um, over a hundred detector dogs a year. So I watched, I do certification exercises with, with these detector dogs. And I'll tell you the people that breeze through these things are the ones who know before the dog actually acquires the sit or the down that there's something there. It, 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 and the people that struggle are the ones who haven't learned to read the peculiarities of their individual dog. And that is a real, it's a pity because if you think about it, like for example, if you're searching a whole load of cargo, your job is not just to find something. Your job is to clear cargo and make sure mm -hmm. that it's okay to get onto a plane. That means the no's are every bit as important as the yeses. You want to make sure you, you bias your training so that you're not missing anything and you're willing to accept something that maybe is ambiguous as a, uh, as, as a positive indication. But you want to make sure that when your dog says something's clear, it's really clear. And um, that means you have to make sure that you get your dog into the productive areas, things, places on that object that are likely to either... Um, be places where scent can emanate from out of there or that trap it and mm -hmm. then figure out the scent problem from there. You know, once the dog gets, if you think of the search chain as three behaviors, search, locate, and report. Search for any odor you can find, uh, you know, any whiff of the target odor you can find, locate the strongest concentrator, concentration of that odor available to you. Some people will say the freshest and piece um and there's there's debate about that and then report that you found something 
So search, locate, report, three behavior chain. Almost all detection work, all search dog work is that. Tracking is the same thing, except in the middle, you're, you locate where the person had been, and then it's a follow, which is a repeat of the locate. Where's the next dot in the connect the dots picture? Mm -hmm. So it behooves you as a, a search dog handler to have, whether it's a tracking dog or a, a detector dog or a search and rescue dog, to keep a mental search map. Know the area you've covered, know the protective areas you've addressed, and then make sure that you've got them covered and you've you've done your job and you want to stay out of the dog's way and let the dog work. But at the same time, if you're tracking or you're searching and you see a change in behavior in your dog and the dog doesn't follow up on it, then later on you think, I, I wonder if there was something there. Aren't you going to, wouldn't you like to make sure you know where to go back and check it? So that's why you need to keep this mental search map. And it's important that you not only mentally log where the dog's behavior changed, but also what happened right before that and right afterwards. Because mm -hmm. you want to see if maybe there was something that happened right before it that triggered the animal's interest in that. Because not everything they investigate. So if you think about it, there's three phases. And Bob, I, I credit Bob Anderson, a retired lieutenant from um, Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office who has International Canyon College for, for articulating it this way. There's interest, investigation, and detection. So the dog's going along and all of a sudden, well, that's interesting. I think I'll follow up on that. Now that's the investigation piece. The dog investigates something and says, oh, this, yes, this is my target odor. I'm going to report that it's there. Or I don't think that's my target odor. It's time to move on. So not everything the dog decides it's going to sniff means it's target odor. The changes and what, and so where really good handlers are is they start to learn the difference at that investigation phase. It's kind of hard to do it during the interest phase. But during the investigation phase where you, you start to get an idea about whether this is target odor or it's something else. And I'll give a classic example. If you've got a tracking dog, because you guys did tracking in St. Paul. And mm -hmm. so we both had tracking centric agencies. And was there anything more frustrating for you when you're on a track and all of a sudden your dog stops at the base of a fire hydrant, fence post, telephone pole, or whatever? Mm -hmm all feet four feet freeze and he goes down there and he sniffs and then all of a sudden you see him go and he starts licking a spot on the ground and at that point you might even see his eyes kind of roll back up in the back of his head his jaw starts to clack and foam starts to come out of his mouth i, I mean those were frustrating moments right that dog is not working target odor at that moment that dog is captured by pheromones in urine and that is uh, for a lot of dogs it is such a hardwired behavior it's really hard to overcome but knowing whether you need to disrupt that before it happens or not if you're going to be the kind of person that issues a correction a verbal or something like that disruptor um i prefer to try and train around it if i can but if you're going to do that you need a clue first and i'm going to tell you I mean, how many times did you ever see a dog hit one of those spots, Don, that his feet didn't stop moving before he started licking? Like, my recollection is almost every time, all four feet go stock still while the dog sits there for a moment to savor it. Oh, what a lovely bouquet. Piquant with just a hint of impertinence. I know, like, they... And then all of a sudden, they, they decide they're really going to savor it and taste. That stopping of the feet is one of the eight scent work indicating behaviors. That's a change in gait. And it's one that you can reliably use to predict that this is probably not your target odor. Because you don't see dogs doing that even when they have an article to lie down at. Because at the article, then they're going to lie down at that thing and they're going to indicate on it with their trained final response or they're going to try and sort through it get through the grass figure it out they will move trying to get themselves to the point where that's going to be there because that's tied to a target that's moving it's not I just about 
I think there's a lot of difference in in observing your dog. I think behavior changes aren't always going to be this great big jerk of the neck or the body or whatever into one location. Some are very subtle and it's kind of, it's what handlers need to understand when they're when they're working their dogs that when they got to the fire hydrant, it was a total different presentation to the fire hydrant than it would be an, a regular odor change or a behavior change on a trained odor because it's different. Yep. Um, I know I know one person who runs his dogs in a dog park, has hides in a dog park just to show that it's the dog is not smell not going to smell urine. He's not going to do this. Uh, he's he's going to uh, work for the uh, narcotics. So it's I think it's the subtleties of this uh, are huge as you're talking about it because it's it's sometimes it's the behavior change is very slight in tracking. It could be just all of a sudden we're pulling a little bit harder, and it, the dog has gotten into odor. And sometimes it may not even be conscious on the dog's part. Um, Brian Am, who was head trainer for Calgary PD uh, back in the day, um, a superb trainer, trained um, in in Stukenbrock uh, in preparation for the Calgary Olympics and came back with a lot of knowledge. But then he developed more. He was just a 100% pure dog guy. And I watched him set up an exercise um, with a... Um, a quarry, a decoy, underneath a false floor in a computer room. So here it is, 18 inch space underneath the floor. This guy's there. The scent is coming out everywhere. Like the dogs, they, the way he structured it, there was no one point where the dogs could really say, this is the hot spot. It was just kind of everywhere. And you'd watch dogs search that building and almost I'd say easily two thirds of those dogs that searched that building would hit that room and want to spend time in there, but couldn't give you a pinpoint. And then they would come back out. And at some point you have to realize what you, know, they, you have to ask, the handlers have to ask, why does my dog continually want to go back here? What's going on? And that's when, you know, your side of the division of labor has to take over and start trying to figure out this problem. Um, so th this is helps us make informed decisions. Being able to read your dog's behavior on that, because when you see, see something like that, there's going to be other things that accompany it. There's going to be a change in gait, maybe a change in nose height, a change in breathing, tail carriage. And when you talk about subtle things, I found out that my dog, uh, a detector dog that I had, it was literally a quarter of a second change in the way she carried her tail when she got when she got to source. And if she didn't show me that, it was one of two things. One, it wasn't target odor. Or two, it was on a refind after I sent her back. But on the first time she found it for herself, she'd shove her nose in there and her tail would freeze for a second and then just start swinging wide and loose. But that if that freeze wasn't there, I missed it. And you, that's why it's important for you to see these subtle things. Because then that's why you probably shouldn't be the one leading the search too. A search team really, if properly done, should have somebody else leading the search. You are there to focus on that dog because it takes so much attention to really do it right. Otherwise, you're going to wind up stumbling into people. And that doesn't always work out very well. I think what we're really saying to the average handler is that you have to understand the dog's behavior change and what he does after the behavior change. Some things are really subtle. And the only way you can get all of that is by putting that dog in many different environments and contexts. So he's challenged in some ways to, to find the odor that he, that he thinks he just got and there was a subtle change. Or the actual ones where he slams it, turns his head, he's there, he's got it. You need to understand how that dog's going to react with different environments, different contexts, so that he gets it down. I mean, it's important that the dog understands, well, what really in reality, we, we, we reinforce that dog every time we use the... Uh, use him to find and search something in training. So he's being reinforced, reinforced, reinforced to the different odors. He's reinforced to finding human scent. Uh, he's reinforced. 
forced to find uh, uh, maybe a dead body or whatever, those kinds of scents and things like that. So that's the building of the behavior change. Now taking that training from the basic ideas and taking him into the different areas to see how he responds to having different things in his path. There's different uh, contexts that I think that really makes it important. Well, and you got to remember that, you know, when you talk about reinforcement, you get what you reinforce and not necessarily what you intended to reinforce. Mm -hmm. You get what you actually reinforced. And so we have to be, you know, astute in our training as we go through this. Um, I want to, in fact, let's talk about this as it relates to dogs searching for people. And like, there's two contexts where you've got dogs searching for people. You've got uh, search and rescue dogs and you got patrol dogs, for example. In those two contexts, they have some common things that you have to worry, you know, you have to think about. And that one of the things is your job, if you're a SAR dog handler or a patrol dog handler, is to give information, is to, is to glean information about where resources can be allocated. If you're a SAR dog handler, it's going to be ground search teams to help find this person If you or the rest of your search party that's with you while you're walking in the woods or, or through the rubble in an urban setting, right? So it's about resource allocation that way. And if you're doing it with a patrol dog, it's about where do the members of my search team need to go? Is there in... It, is there a point of danger ahead that my dog can give us warning about? Can I, you know, is that, is there something I need to tell them about where to position themselves or tell them so that they can make a decision about where to position themselves? Um, and so your job is to gather intelligence about your search areas you're going, whether it's a SAR dog or a patrol dog, that's it. For a patrol dog, you're looking for advanced warning in, in addition, SAR dog, Advanced warning isn't in anywhere near as much of an issue as is the resource allocation piece, but they're both really important. And this is about, you know, what we have to do in operations. This is why learning to read your dog, um, don't do it because you want to be able to communicate to judges and juries. Don't do it because, um, you know, it's cool or anything like that. Do it because it makes you more effective in the search process. That's why we do this. And when you get to tracking dogs, it's a whole different thing because the, the moving parts in a track are pretty complex because you, you'll have a dog that is in the process of, of trying to complete a connect the dots picture. Don't think of a track as a linear event. There are going to be places in here um, that where the dog is going to struggle. It's not going to, it's not going to have scent to work on because a bunch of cars have driven over it or it overshot a turn and it has to require. So you're always looking for these moments when the dog is off. There's a great little pamphlet that's on the internet. You can probably find it about how to re read any, uh, any trailing dog. And it applies to tracking trailing dogs. The, the idea is um, learning to read the negatives when the dog is out of scent is is what makes the difference between somebody who's a truly effective handler and somebody who can just follow a dog. If the dog never misses, you just follow the dog. But if the dog all of a sudden shows negatives and can't reacquire because it's not in the physical position, then you're the one who using that mental track map we talked about earlier should be able to go back and show that dog a place that's worth checking to see if maybe it can reacquire. That's, so dang unuseful. And again, McKenzie's system in that thousand hour eyes talk is what gives you the ability to articulate, hey, I saw this here. Let's go back and check that out. Uh, or I saw this, hey, dog, come on, you're with, I'm with you. Let's go see if we can find this spot again and pick this thing back up. It's really important. And by the way, you can use the same information, learning to read a dog really well. Once you've done it with enough different dogs, it'll help you pick better dogs for your job mm -hmm. you'll pick the dogs that really have clear scenting behaviors because that's going to help everybody get their job off done so it's it's really important to do this and it's really important for tracking dogs because tracking dogs are one of the only venues in which you're going to give opinion testimony in other words you're going to be asked say is the person you found 
the person that was at the scene of the crime where you started your track. You are establishing a link between those two things. All right. And to do that, you have to give the opinion that, yes, the person I found is the person I started on. That means your dog has to be competent in following a track and it has to be competent in discriminating between the track layer scent and that of other people who may have crossed that track in the meantime. I've got a question for you. So Gene, you know, Gene Ramirez has said that we should start advising people to uh, verbally say when your dog has a behavior change, because with the body worn cameras now, you actually may be facing a different way and saw your dog do a behavior change and the camera doesn't capture it. What do you think about tracks on that? Um, I'm not going to opine on whether it's a good idea to do it in operations. Um, I think uh, everything has, there, there are no answers. There are only trade-offs, mm -hmm. right? I'm a, I'm a big Thomas Sowell fan in that regard. The trade-off in doing that is there are going to be a lot of times where your dog's behavior change will change during a track and it will start to, people will get numb listening to that possibly. Sure. So it's, it's important to do in times when you actually, when you're really, I think when you're getting close, that's the time you really want it. You also want it at a time when you've decided to make a point in your mental search map about, oh, that was something about that stood out to me. That may be a time you want to say it. Yes. And, and but other than that, you just don't want that. I will use as a training device, a, a commentary track. I, do you remember the days when you took um, emergency vehicle operation and control class? You know, you took no. driving class. You didn't, you never took a class on how to drive a patrol car. Oh yeah, we did that. Yes. Yeah. And um, when we did that, we went through, when we were in the academy back, uh, I see it was 1980 for me. Um, you, you, we did it at the state patrol. And one of the things they had you do after you finished driving on the course is take you out in the, into the area around Shelton, Washington, where State Patrol uh, Academy is. And they had you do a commentary drive. And the idea was you were to, as you're driving, just have this stream of consciousness conversation, one-sided talk to your driving instructor about the possible hazards in front of you. What do you see? So I'm going down a, you know, a straight road. There's a, a T intersection off to the right coming up. I can't see if it's controlled or not at this point. I don't have any cars coming my way. Oh, wait a minute. I see a light shining against the trees. That may be a car coming in from a side road. Fill in the blanks. Mm -hmm. You can do the same thing with a track. So if you have this, if you have the McKenzie system, like in Thousand Hour Eyes, you have to have some kind of common language where you're where you and your trainers agree on it. I just choose that one. I'm sure there are others out there, but the whole point is a commentary track is a really powerful tool for helping handlers get comfortable with assigning significance to the things they see, seeing what is and isn't important. And then coming back later on and looking at that video and listening to it later on, you start to sort the wheat from the chaff and you can figure out where the 80 percent of um information comes from and it's probably only about 20 percent of the behavior changes the dog gives you there you there 20 percent of the of the behavior changes are are the money changes the other 80 percent are useful and in fact at once you really understand those first 20 percent if you learn what the sub 20 percent of that remaining 80 percent is all of a sudden now you got 90 per six, six percent of the valuable information from that dog that you need. That's where this gets really good. And when you give opinion testimony about this and you're describing those behaviors to a jury, whether you've articulated them on your body worn or not, you're giving that opinion. You have to qualify as an expert to give opinion testimony. And to qualify as an expert, I would recommend that you go through a predicate questionnaire where it talks about how you learn this, your training, your background. And that's a whole different talk you and I can have someday is about um, courtroom testimony for canine. I think that's a, and I think Gene should be in on that. We should have like a three-way conversation with Gene about courtroom testimony for canine, not just 
um, the criminal side, but also on the civil side, because we work in a job that entails officer safety risk and officer safety risk carries with it liability risk. The greater the officer safety risk you have to address, the more likely you're going to do something that will, will wind up engendering liability risk. They go hand in hand. And we have the most dangerous day-to-day -day job on the planet, uh, you know, in, in, in law enforcement. SWAT has maybe on a per incident basis, more safety risk and liability exposure, but they aren't out there day-to-day -day the same way we are searching as often as we are having something that literally drags you to conversation, uh, confrontation with a resistive suspect. You know, he's already demonstrated the will willingness to resist it, it by flight. So because you have to qualify as an expert, to, then I think it's incumbent on every canine handler to have expertise in reading their dog. Period. End of statement. We don't need to talk about it anymore. Just commit yourself to developing expertise in reading the, your dog. You don't have to know every other dog, but if you can read your dog and you can describe those repeatable behaviors that consistently appear in the presence of target odor or um, on acquisition of a track or reacquisition of a track, you'll be all right. Thanks, Steve. I think it's important, and I think you've shown it, we've talked about it, that it is important to understand uh, the behavior changes, the final responses, uh, the idea that you're tracking with your dog and the dog is going to give you a behavior change. There's all there's many things that the dog can give a behavior change, but the behavior changes may not be as unique as to the ones that they're being that they've been trained on. So I hope you uh, have enjoyed uh, this uh, segment of behavior change by Steve White from retired from Seattle and myself, Don Slavic, the executive director of the United States Police Canine Association. And thank you for listening. Thanks, Don. Perfect. Yeah.